Pastor, you are not audible. He spoke in a way, when the Lord Jesus spoke, he spoke in a way that brought people to understand what they were speaking. Right? So we completed chapter six, sorry, chapter, yes, chapter six on Jesus the teacher, and we looked at the different parables. Uh, now let's get into chapter seven, the teacher in the early church. Now, when you look at the teacher in the early church, we see that just like how the ministry of the evangelist you know, started from Philip and then it went on and we also saw in church history that the ministry of the evangelist just keep, kept going, just kept increasing. So we look at what happened here, right? Uh, look at what happened in the early church, Acts chapter 5, the teacher in the early church, Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. Shall we open to Acts 5, 42? And we'll just look at a few of these verses, and then we'll get into certain instructions that we must follow in the teaching ministry. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaim, proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Mm. 13, 1. Same chapter. Also. Yes. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Uh, is that Acts 13 and verse 1? Sorry, sorry. I'll yeah. Uh, Acts 13, 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Nigger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menenian, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Yeah. So again, we see the rise of teachers here, right? Then um, Acts maybe 18, 11. This is Apostle Paul's missionary, second missionary and journey. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. He stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Okay, uh, Acts 28 and 31, the last one. Acts 28, verse 31. Got it, got it. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about Lord Jesus Christ. Right, so we see that from what Jesus did, the early church, the church in Jerusalem, it moves on into Antioch. Antioch, it spreads into different churches. By Acts 13, which uh, after Paul had finished his first missionary journey, there were already people who were teachers and leaders in the church. Paul, wherever he went in his missionary journeys, he taught people, he raised up leaders who would teach people the word of God. Now, remember this, there is a difference between teaching and preaching. Yes, right? Preaching involves certain attributes. Teaching is something where we go in depth, we get into detail. We can preach the word of God, but we, we can also, we are also called to teach the word of God. Remember Jesus, he preached on the parable of the sower. But after the teaching of the parable, sorry, preaching of the parables, they didn't understand it. So what did he do? He taught them what it means. Now, for example, on a Sunday morning, we will preach End times Bible prophecies. So we talked about Russia, Turkey, and all of them converging into Israel and the battle of Gog, Magog, and uh, uh, the battle of Armageddon, right? Last, yesterday. So now we preached it. It's not like everyone, maybe many of them may not have understood. It may not have gone in too much into detail, but now we can teach them. Right? We, we, we have to sit, we have to teach them. This is what this means. So there's a difference. Teaching involves going in depth, right? And that's what Jesus did, and that's what the early teachers did. So let's look at a few instructions that you and I can apply while we get opportunities to teach. Now, these are guidelines. There are many more, but these are a few instructions that we can keep in mind. Now, first one. The teaching believer, Romans chapter 12 and verse 7. 
Let's read that. And someone else can please open to Colossians 3.16. Romans 12, 7. It, if it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. Yes. Now, Paul is talking about the gifts in the church, to the Roman church here. He's saying there are many gifts. There are many, uh, uh, there's, there's grace given to the church for many of them. But if it is, says it, we have different gifts, verse 66. 12 verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him prophesy to the proportion of faith that he has. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. Right? So, as a believer, if God has given you the grace and the gift to teach, you teach. Right? Now, remember, you may not have, you may have gone to Bible college, you may have learned, you may not have gone to Bible college and learned. Bible college is not a prerequisite to become a teacher of the Word of God. Bible college is an equipping center, but we can be a teacher and a believer without Bible college. But then we'll have to do some preparation. We'll have to go back, read, right? We'll have to do that back, back, background work. Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in your rich, you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonizing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Yeah. Let the word of Christ dwell among you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Right. So, the ministry. So, as a believer. The word of Christ dwells in us. And Paul is exhorting the church in Colossae. He's saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you. When the word of Christ is dwelling in you, you will be able to apply it and teach it to others. Right? Then, the ministry gift of teaching. Now, the first one is the teaching believer. I may not have the gift of teaching. Example. We right now we see that there are many. Okay, let me think of a good teacher of God's word. Um, you have John Piper, you have John MacArthur, these are wonderful teachers of God's word. Of course, they are in the pastoral calling, but they also teach God's word. Right now, there's a there's a responsibility for all of us as believers, the teaching believer, but there's also the gift, the ministry gift of teaching. Ephesians 4:11. And 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Ephesians 4, 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Mm. He himself gave it. So we looked at chapter 1. It's a gift from God. right? Uh, and, and, and so there's a ministry gift, and we recognize that gift. We walk in that gift. We grow in that gift. Then 1 Corinthians 12, 8, 28. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. And God has appointed these in church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, miracles, then gifts of healing, yeah. helps, administration. God himself, thank you, God himself has appointed some in the church. Right? So you have the ministry gift of teaching. Thirdly, do and then teach. Now here comes the challenge. We can teach. Mm. Practice and then preach. Now here, do and then teach. Let's read Matthew 5.19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the mm. kingdom of heaven. Look at what Jesus is saying. Whoever does and then teaches shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the problem here was when Jesus was on during his earthly ministry, you had all of these people, rabbis, teachers of the law, right? Uh, Pharisees, the the all all these leaders in the temple, 
they were all doing something, but they were not doing it the right way. They were all teaching, but they were not following. That's why Paul, that's why Jesus was so stern with them. He said, you people are like hypocrites, talking to the Pharisees and the rulers of the law. He said, you people are like hypocrites. You know why? Because you stand in the corner of the streets where people always walk, and there you stand and you pray. So that when people pass by, they will see you and say, oh, look at this man, he's so holy. And he's praying such a you know, 24 hours he's praying. He's praying for us, for the people of Israel. But his mind is somewhere else. He's being a hypocrite. So Jesus is saying, don't be like them where they are trying to put up a show. Rather, be somebody who, who practices and then teaches. You don't see Jesus standing on street corners and, pre and uh, praying. Did he do that? Everywhere in his earthly ministry, he went away from the people into a solitary place and prayed. Prayer is not a place to show off. Prayer is a place of communion with God. There's no place of, you know, very interesting. Preaching, worship, you know, public ministry, anything in the public ministry, it's very easy that to put up a show. Prayer, you can't put up a show. You cannot put up a show in the prayer ministry. It has to be real or it's just something that's fake. Jesus is teaching here, he's saying, do and then teach. Don't be like them, but practice what you do and then teach. And when you do that, great will be your reward in heaven. Now, this is a very important lesson for us. We may tell people to do something, but we must first do it. As leaders in your ministries, in the Bible college itself, if you want people to listen to you, you got to do and then teach. I remember as a student, right? The first year, people were very upset with me. You know, they, they, all my classmates, you know, they didn't, because I would do, I was always, you know, just minding my own business or spending extra time in prayer. And, uh, you know, if pe teachers come, I would say, uh, okay, you know, when the teacher, you, during our time, after lunch, we had classes all up, all the way up to five, right? So we would sit and I was really interested in classes, genuinely, right? I wanted to learn. So many times the t students say, uh, you know, so we want a break. We, we, we're, we're not able to understand. We want to take a break now. And I would say, but we need to learn. No, and then the students will get upset. My classmates will get upset with me. Now, over after the first year, all of them who were upset with me, all of a sudden, they became very close to me. They all said, you know, Paul, you you lead the Bible college, meaning you lead us, you 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 be there for us. You tell us what to do, we'll do it. First year, they were all upset. They didn't want to. Second year of Bible college, they said, whatever you say, Paul. So Friday, I would tell them, can we do two hours of, uh, you know, one hour of worship, one hour of prayer. Can we do that? Yeah, yeah we'll do it. First year, they said, we're not even coming. And they'll be very upset. Second, whatever I shared with them, they started, you know, listening and they started. Now, the reason is not because of me, not because, because, but they saw, hey, this guy is doing something different that we are not doing. So we also need to grow. We also want to, we've come here, this is the last final year. So probably their hearts were changed, but I saw a change in them. Many of them, right? They were willing to sit, they were willing to pray. Many times they would get up early morning, they would say, Paul, can I sit with you and pray? It was not because I because I'm praying, no, because they wanted to learn, they wanted to grow themselves. They realized that, hey, I can't just be teaching and preaching without doing it myself, right? 
So the whole of second year, all of these students, very, very, you know, they became very open. And they, I remember there were times I would tell them, hey, can we on Saturday go and we'll just have one hour of worship and uh, prayer? And maybe we have the Bible college for us, nothing to do, right? We'll do all our work. We'll go evening, comfortable time, five to six in the evening, or five to seven. So leave it open. So initially, you know, five, six people come. And then later on, all the, it was like the whole Bible college had come on Saturdays. Everyone would come and we would have one hour of worship. There were times you go on one hour, two hours of worship, three hours of worship, just spending time there. You know, then we would ask questions to each other. It was like a mini Bible college itself on its own. What do you think about this? So we would sit, all of us, and talk. Now, this is on a holiday, on Saturday, not on a weekday. These are the guys who said, Paul, you know, don't make it difficult for us. Something changed. See, when you do and then you teach people, it adds value. People will recognize that, right? And people will be willing to sacrifice for your sake. So do and then teach. Do not teach the commandments of men. Very important. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9. Matthew 15, 9. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. They worship me in vain, and teach, and their teachings are but rules taught by men. Now, is rules good or not good? Rules are good. But these people are teaching rules taught by men, meaning the whole point here is, they're coming, coming up with their own ideologies. They're coming up with their own uh, you know, thoughts, their own patterns. When I'm saying do this, they are doing something else. right? And so here, Jesus is saying, he's, setting, uh, he's talking to you know, the, the believers, the, those who are following him, his followers, and he's saying, they, they, they teach me in vain. They're teaching about rules taught by men, meaning it has no value. Right? Now, we are teaching you the word of God. You teach people the word of God. Of course, there are certain things that we apply in, in all of this, and uh, there are certain uh, rules and uh, things that we have to follow, right? like what we were talking about, natural and the spiritual combine it together. But here, he's trying to say that the whole way of doing worship, the whole way of um, ministry is become like rules and regulations. Their hearts are far away. Three songs. Finish the three songs. Okay. Then do this, then do this, then do this. Becomes a systematic rule. These are the rules. But Jesus is saying, we, we are not teaching people commandments of men, but commandments of God. God is the one who orchestrates things, right? Next, he says, go teach all things. Sorry, go teach all nations, all things. This is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. 19 and 20. Go ahead. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. Just, just stop there. Go here. Now Jesus is giving him the commission. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the first thing after that is teaching them not prophesying over them, not healing them, not delivering them, teaching them, so that when we teach them, they will learn and they will be able to teach others what they have learned. And it's interesting, no? Jesus is 
the last time he's meeting his disciples face to face saying go make disciples how do you make disciples teaching them not not baptizing them in the gifts of the soul. first teach then you do everything else right yeah so the holy spirit is our teacher john 14 26 go ahead john 14 and verse 26 but the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that i said to you he will teach you all things and he will bring to remembrance all the things that i have said to you now remember remember jesus in his ministry he's he's in the temple and everyone are looking at the temple and say well, master look at this structure so beautiful what does jesus say i tell you the truth all of this will be fallen down and then later on he goes on to say you destroyed this temple and i will rebuild it in three days everyone get upset you're not even 40 years old it took them more than 40 years old to build this temple how will you build this temple in three days then the scriptures say that after jesus died he resurrected from the dead the disciples understood that this is what jesus was talking about imagine this all the while they didn't understand it all the while they didn't understand it but when the holy spirit came and ministered to them after the death resurrection of jesus then they understood oh this is what he meant the holy spirit brought to remembrance to the disciples maybe it was like a picture oh we remember jesus he was walking here and he said, I will build, I will raise it up in three days. Now we understand. Now the Holy Spirit is bringing it to remembrance to us. Now we are able to understand, really, you know, understand what he meant. He didn't mean physical building. He meant his own body. And, you know, the Holy Spirit brought to remembrance. So in our lives, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. One, he will teach us, he will reveal what is hidden, what is mysteries, what we don't understand. He will give us the wisdom to understand. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And two, he will bring to remembrance things that we already know. Right. So for example, see, we may read a passage of scripture. Or we may have thought something 10 years back. Now, 10 years later, you're picking up the same topic. The Holy Spirit can remind you what you did 10 years back. He can bring to remembrance. Remember, 10 years back, you gave this point to the dot. He can tell you. He can remind you. This is what you said. So use this in your sermon or use this in your teaching. Or he can remind you of something that you, you know, you have said or done 15 years back. He can bring it into remembrance now. Remember, 10 years back you prayed this. You may have forgotten, but the Holy Spirit will remind you. See, 10 years back you had prayed it, and now I'm fulfilling the desire of your heart. So, very, very important as teachers, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Listen, if we read this in our natural mind, we will we will not get it. You know why? Remember Jesus? What did he do? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of my kingdom. Half of them turned and went home. They said, no ways. I'm not, I don't want to be a cannibal. I don't want to eat your... This is against God's law. How can you say this, Jesus? How can I eat your body, drink your blood? What are you talking? Half of them went off. They said they stopped following Jesus after that. Why? They thought of it in the natural. They didn't understand what he was talking about. Now, when we read certain things in the scriptures, we may not understand, but the Holy Spirit is our teacher, and he brings to remembrance. He, un he unveils. 
right? I, I remember this many years back. I was I was doing a study on Job, right? and I was as I was reading, I suddenly realized Job is a contemporary of Abraham, and I thought to myself, what is happening here? I thought Job is much later. Job and Abraham were the same times. I didn't know it. I've been I've been teaching for so many years. This happened when I was in Bible college. I've, I've read so much, but I didn't know. It. But then the Holy Spirit started bringing so many, so much of clarity in certain things that I was reading. So I was reading uh, the life of Abraham, and I was reading the life of Job hand in hand. I'm trying to see what is happening here. See, it, they are the contemporaries. During the same time, God is ministering to two different people in two different ways. Abraham wanted a son. God made a great covenant with Abraham. But God made him wait for many years. Right? Went through challenges. Here, Job, everything was good for him. But he went through many, many, many difficulties. You see, but it really helped me to understand how God works. So when I when I teach, I can always bring these two in mind, Abraham and Job. Okay. So again, that's the leading of the Holy. The Holy Spirit can give us that will give us that wisdom. Okay. So depend on the Holy Spirit. Yes, Akhil. So we now have the scriptures, and now yeah. we understand <clears throat> what Jesus was referring when he said, uh, "You unless you eat uh, flesh yeah. and uh, thing." Now, back then, forget about the people who left because they didn't uh, think. The people who stayed, were they in a position to understand because Jesus has not gone to the cross, but were they able to understand what Jesus was referring to? You were saying, eat of flesh and my body. I would say, maybe to a certain extent, but not fully. Yeah. See, there were many things that the disciples didn't understand also. But they stayed with Jesus because they knew there was something about him. Because, see, or the disciples knew that he is the Messiah. They were convinced of that. But his teachings were very difficult. So there were some teachings they didn't understand. But they knew that, you know, he is the Son of God. He's saying something. Uh, and the miracles, of course, Jesus himself says, if you don't believe me, look at the miracles that I'm doing. The miracles testify of who I am. So to answer your question, they may not have understood but they stayed with him. Of course, now we can you know, go back. We understand it. I think the early church also understood it. Right? Later on, when Paul brought the whole, uh, you know, when Paul had this revelation and he began to teach people, this is what it means, the body and the blood. And, uh, but that time, they may not have understood. Even the disciples may not have understood. But they still chose to stay. Or maybe later on, Jesus may have explained to them what it means. Right now, again, if we look at it, yeah, the Last Supper, of course. But then, before even before that, he may have explained to them. Yeah, some way he might have said, "See, this is what I'm going to do," because in Jesus's ministry, many many places he has told. He was fourteen times he's told his disciples, "I'm going to the cross." 14 times. I'm not going to be here. I'm going. I'm going. Preparing them. So it also could be that, you know, he would have explained to them, talked to them, tried to make them understand. They may have understood, but they may not have understood, but they stayed back. Right? But some of them took offense to what he said and they left. Right? So, yeah, but now on the other side of the cross, we know everything. So we are. At a better advantage now, so we understand it in a better way, right? So the point now is the Holy Spirit is our teacher. If you want to go back and read about in the Old Covenant, the offerings, the guilt offering, the sin offering, the grain offering, all these offerings, we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. We can read about it, but the Holy Spirit brings revelation. He teaches us. So depend on the Holy Spirit. He can, he he can bring clarity where there is, you know, confusion or doubt. He brings clarity. Then, each with the wisdom of the Spirit. First Corinthians two thirteen. Let's read. 
even as we know that the Holy Spirit is our teacher, draw from the Holy Spirit and teach with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.13 1 Corinthians 2.13 And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Yeah. So if you look, if you read a couple of verses up before this, you get a little bit of context. I'll just read a few of it, right? A few verses uh, on the same chapter, chapter 2, 6 onwards. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. But the not, but not the wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom. See how many times the word wisdom is used? A wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Right, go down. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Go down. This is what we speak. Not the words thought, by, thought us by human wisdom, but in the words thought by the spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. See the number of times he's using the word spirit, sorry, wisdom, right? Now, when you and I teach, we teach in the wisdom of the spirit. Now, remember this. There's the wisdom of the world. There's a wisdom of the spirit. There's worldly wisdom. There's godly wisdom. We need worldly wisdom as well, but we depend on godly wisdom. We stand on godly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is something, it's a natural attribute that is gained, it's developed, right? But spiritual wisdom is a greater wisdom. Paul's writing to the believers and he's saying, the wisdom of the cross. Now, the worldly wisdom is, you can have somebody who's very wise, a great scientist or a great um, person, intellectual in every way, right? knows many languages, he has learned many things, he knows how to deal with people, he knows how to uh, solve problems, he's got worldly wisdom, and, but he does not have spiritual wisdom. For him, the cross is foolishness. I'll give you an example. One of the greatest astrophysicists of all times, Stephen Hawking, I'm a victim of Lou Bedick's disease. He's, he speaks to a voice synthesizer. He's a genius, utter genius. He now holds the chair where, uh, he, you know, which Isaac Newton used to uh, professor which Isaac Newton was a professor and he holds that chair right now. He's a genius. He can, he can, you know, just narrate all the, you know, what do you call those, uh, formulas in astrophysics. Come up with all kinds of things, theories. Right? Uh, and, you know, all of that wisdom of understanding how the earth was created, all, all of those things. But in the end of all those formulas, he says, somewhere the pose of a fish came in contact with the universe, with the earth. And out of those pores of the fish came out the living beings. And, and uh, now all of those formulas, all the learning ended up in this. Simple wisdom is Genesis chapter 1 says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Finish there. No. Why you want these hundred thousand formulas and then all the fish comes and the pores of the fish. But he's a genius. He can narrate more than you know hundred formulas at one. There's a saying that in one of his interviews, he was he was talking to the interviewer through the voice synthesizer. He was giving formulas. 
somewhere down the line, he made a mistake. He realized he made a mistake. He goes all the way back, corrects that mistake, and comes back. He's a genius, I'll tell you. But fish pours from the, another world came, go, came in contact. For us, we are better off spiritual wisdom. If I meet Stephen Hawking, he's going on with all that. I'll say, okay, you are a brilliant man. I understand that. But for me, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 is more than enough. In the beginning, God created it. Finish it. All the formulas and all is your wish. Do what you want. See, you got the natural wisdom, human wisdom, but you got spiritual wisdom. Now, spiritual wisdom, when we teach on spiritual wisdom, we are able to impact lives. Lives change. We are, because we are dependent on the spirit, not on our own ability. Spiritual wisdom enables us to also teach in the right way. You know, we can have a lot of knowledge and from the Bible and know everything from the Bible. But if we don't walk in wisdom, we will fail. Imagine I know everything from the Bible. And I come and I start preaching and teaching the people and saying, you know, you are like this, you are all sinners. And, uh, you know, just putting everyone down and rebuking everyone. I'm not speaking in wisdom. There's a time and a place for that. Right? When we teach, we teach with the spirit of wisdom. Right? So, next one. A love to receive material gifts. The teacher in the early church. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 6. Galatians 6, 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Yeah. So basically talking about sharing and uh, being there for for each other. I want to go to the next one. Very important. Ensure sound doctrine. Now look at this. First Timothy 1.3, 1 Timothy 6.3, 2 Timothy 4.3 and Titus. All written by Paul. And all of them talking about sound doctrine. Let's read the first two. 1 Timothy 1 and 3. And 1 Timothy 6.3. Go ahead. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain if, in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Mm. Paul is now assigned Timothy to go to Ephesus and he's saying, you remain there. You look after the church, pastor the church. But even as you do that, ensure and command men not to teach false doctrine. Right. Next one. First Timothy chapter six, verse three. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent, consent to whole, wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. If a person who teaches false doctrines does not agree to the sound instructions of the Lord, that person is conceited and does not have any understanding. Remember, Paul is writing to leaders in the church, to Timothy, saying, make sure the doctrine that is taught is right. Can you think, think of this? This is his last two letters to, Eph to uh, Ephesus, to Timothy. He's not saying, come on, you should start being prophetic, you should start doing working of miracles. He's not focusing on that. Have you ever thought of this? This is the last letter. You don't see Paul writing too much about uh, miracles here. His focus is the word. Teach the word. Even Second Timothy goes on, he says, in season, out of season, preach the word. Whether you like it, you don't like it, preach the word. Second Timothy 4.3 Uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, okay. they will help us for themselves teachers. The time will come when people will not like sound doctrine. So they'll want something new, a new doctrine, 
something more exciting something that people will enjoy to hear paul is saying don't 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 fall for that trap you stay with the simple doctrine of the word of god because that is what is going to bring truth that is what is going to bring revelation that is what is going to touch people and change their lives right so we see the focus here paul is saying there are people in the church who will come up with so, uh, wrong doctrines be careful of them so as a teacher ensure that you teach wrong doctrine uh, sorry uh, sound doctrine right there will be doctrines happening all across right now in a time and age that we are living in anything is possible you have ministers who are standing i somebody sent me a video and so terrible video and i saw it as furious to my I was just thinking what is happening the video was this minister of god he is a minister of god for 20 years and he says this he says god said god is love so we need to he's uh, an lgbtq right uh, meaning he he professes he was okay with gay and lesbian marriages and he was one who would even ordain and um, uh, ordain and be there for these weddings and uh, you know solemnize these weddings and all of it so he says this in the video somebody sent it to me and after watching it i deleted it got so upset because in that he's saying that even to say it i feel so terrible but i'm going to say just to bring context this man this priest for this minister of god is saying john was resting on jesus's bosom so what does it mean jesus was also okay that's what the word that's what he said and there are hundreds and thousands of them who are going to believe him what he said very viral these are the things that get viral yeah. what's happening is oh yeah they start thinking and so it's okay it's okay to do what i want to do and paul is writing he's saying there will come a time when people will want to hear what their itching ears will want to hear now we are seeing this it's going to get worse even more as time goes by but you and i as teachers of the word of god must ensure sound doctrine forget about what people say forget about what people are doing is it right or is it wrong simple is it right now remember this is happening from many years only thing now there's all media attention romans chapter 1 and 2 talks about this only men involving with other men women with other women mothers and children the romans such horrific sin yet the word of god being ministered to them they change their lives so you and i as teachers of the word of god we must ensure that we have we stand for the truth now if a person comes to me and says you know i am gay but i'm a believer what should i do i'll say see as a believer i love you i care for you but what you're doing is wrong you're not born this way but god can deliver you from this i have to bring out the truth I'm going to bring it out it can be hard it can be stern but it is the truth remember what jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free so focus on the truth right you know especially now going forward as the enemy is working we will have many kinds of doctrines coming up somebody may suddenly say i am jesus somebody may suddenly say you know new things i am peter the apostle or paul the apostle you never know what is going to come up someone may say i am the holy spirit you never know what was going to come up the enemy has no boundaries but we have certain boundaries we have the word of god we stick to it we teach this we will see lives changed and paul the apostle 
you see all through the book of Acts, when in his missionary journeys, remember what he did? We talked about that, right? Acts 16, Acts 17, he's in Athens. Acts 19, everywhere he preached the word, people's lives were changed. So that's what you and I can do. Stick to sound doctrine. If you are unsure about certain things that you've heard in social media or you heard pastors preaching and teaching, go back to the word, test it. Ask, get godly counsel. Ask your pastors, ask leaders, get suggestions. Try to find out, ask the Holy Spirit to, to minister to you, and He will. Don't go about just teaching it just because you heard it from somebody. Test it. Ensure sound doctrine. Amen. Okay, we'll stop here and we'll pick up next class from women teachers. Um, so just put a mark there, women teachers, and then we'll uh, pick up on Friday from there. All right. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll catch up the coming Friday. God bless you all.